said already, um, I'm a hydrologist basically right now, postdoc in uh, Uppsala. And um, so I've done a couple of different things like hydrological modeling, climate change impact, uncertainty analysis, um, hazard and risk assessment, mainly also for flooding. And um, one of the topics I've been working on was are also like weather generation techniques, and that's mainly the core topic of that talk today in the context of flood modeling. Um, very briefly on our um, uh, department in Uppsala, so it's the Department of Earth Sciences, we have um, um, a couple of different research programs, and I'm in the air, water, and landscape science um, um, program in the hydrology unit, which <laughs> is headed by Giuliano Di Baltasare. Um, another yeah, institution actually we have in Uppsala is the so-called Center of Natural Hazards and Disaster Science, CNDS. So that's actually an organization that involves a couple of different departments at three different uh, Swedish uh, universities, which is mainly the Karstad University, Swedish Defense University, and Uppsala University. And we are also part of it as the Department of Earth Sciences. And uh, Juliana Di Baldassar is now the director of CNDS. And what makes it quite interesting is actually that all the research that is done around natural hazards and disaster science is actually quite close collaboration also with stakeholders. So it's very nice that we have some stakeholders here uh, today too. And um, yeah, have a look at our homepage. We are um, every, every now and then announcing also positions. Right now we hired a couple of new PhD students. So training actually is also a very important activity in the, in the CNDS network. Um, so that's the structure for today. So um, I would like to start with flood hazard estimation as an introduction. So we're gonna mainly talk about frequency analysis to get then like the context when we change to more, let's say, physical flood hazard assessment. Um, what's weather generation? So to give you a brief overview, and then I will like present on a couple of different model modeling techniques basically. So this is really only a very small, let's say, sh snapshot on what's actually existing. So there are a couple of, or actually many different modeling approaches, and I will probably present on yeah, the most prominent ones, let's say, including a model I've developed myself. I don't know if that's the most prominent one, probably not, but um, just that you know it's um, just a snapshot. Then, um, as these models are all on um, daily resolution, um, I will briefly talk about some disaggregation techniques, which is usually how it's done if you start daily and then you disaggregate into higher resolution. And then, because that's the reason why I'm here, I'm going to briefly talk about the Steep Streams project. So that's actually a project where Uppsala is collaborating with Trento, um, where we are doing flood hazard modeling in, in small alpine catchments here around the region. So. Still, actually, in seismic practice, flood frequency analysis is, yeah, the most common tool I would say. So, and that means that we fit some kind of mathematical distribution to a time series of extreme flows. So we extrapolate, and um, there are a couple of limitations with that approach. Um, one of the biggest issues is usually that we make predictions for very low probabilities, and usually we have quite short time series. So the uncertainties are very high. We don't have any information about the flood volume, so we fit it to peaks. And um, what we also have to be aware of is that flooding is a physical phenomenon. So every change in the catchment, like land use changes, climate change, or also like uh, hydraulic infrastructure, we cannot account for it with flood frequency analysis. And usually it's also only applying to a single location, but flooding actually is a spatial process. And we completely ignoring that with flood frequency analysis. And we also have to be aware of that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing. You can have old models that are good, but flood frequency analysis was actually first presented as a tool in the early 20th century. So at least we should question ourselves and we should not take a step further at some point. Um, so that's what I just said. The objective <coughs> is that you relate the magnitude of the events to a certain Frequency with a mathematical function, you need usually long time series, at least 30 years. <coughs> then you can uh, estimate different uh, return periods or 
exceedance probabilities. Um, it's important that these data are independent and come from the same distribution. And one issue is actually that the data sets must not have any obvious trends and no artifacts. And the next slide is actually what I usually show to my students. So that's an example I took from the homepage of the Canadian government. And what we see here is actually is an example of the Hanbury River in Canada. It's actually a time series from 1977 to 2002 with a fit of a Pearson distribution without a specific extreme events that occurred in 1991. And it seems to be a quite reasonable fit. The point is when you include that event from 91, it looks completely different. That event was actually much higher than the highest observed record in the, in the re remaining years. So if you look at the estimation, for example, for the 100 year flood, here it would be somewhere above 600 QMAX. Here it's likely about 200, just by adding one sample point. So you really need to know your data. What actually happened here is that in 91, there was an ice jam in the river, holding back the water, and then that broke and led to this observed extreme peak. So you have to be really careful with flood frequency analysis and when, when, when you fit a curve, so you really need to know your data. <clears throat> Some further aspects, of course, I mean, I don't want to insult anyone working with it because we know that, that fitting a curve is not so straightforward. So a couple of like fancy methods. So, but in general, let's say it's a fairly robust tool that's easy to implement. I would also say that it has some justification because it's really easy to go for some national standards that we need. We might say, uh, okay, the national standard is you have three distribution types that are standard. You take one of them and then you, you go for a Q100 estimation plus some additional topping on the graph or something like that. So there might also be legal aspects. And um, so it has been proven to be a robust tool. Um, but as a hydrologist, I would say it's not necessarily hydrologic science. It's statistics, mathematics. Um, in that respect, I recently talked with uh, Ricardo about it. There's a very nice paper on, um, by uh, Beat Clems, uh, Dilettantism and Hydrology. It's also addressing a bit the uh, flood frequency analysis under the umbrella of hydrology. It's a very nice read. Some aspects are maybe outdated. Some are still valid in my eyes. But I think we are hydrologists, so we should probably go a step further. So. If we, probably it's the first time somebody asking this in this department, but what is hydrologic science? And if we go for the, one of the official definition, it says it's a science that encompasses the occurrence, distribution, movement, and properties of the waters of the earth and their relationship with the environment within each phase of the hydrologic cycle. So this is hydrology. And in my eyes, we have the tools to be real hydrologists. So we have weather generation, which I'm gonna talk about today, with hydrological models, climate models, land use models. So, and these models are obviously getting better and better. So we talked yesterday about new age. I mean, so much has improved over the years. The models are getting better and better and the same applies to weather generation techniques. So, I mean, the basic idea of weather generation is now also, yeah, uh, not very recent, but recently more and more refined algorithms have been published. So. We have the tools and also in the context actually of um, flood research, we can use these tools. And that uh, basically um, brings me to the weather generation because most of you might be aware of all the other aspects, hydrological models, of course, climate models, energy models, but weather generation, um, maybe not, I don't know. Um, or who else has worked with that weather generation? Is someone here? That's good, because <laughs> 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 then my talk makes sense. So weather, yeah, what is weather generation? So the basic idea is actually, when we start from the weather, that we generate lo long weather sequences based on gauge records, usually. Um, and in most of the cases, weather generators generate precipitation and temperature. And um, it's a tool actually that is not only relevant for hydrology or flood hazard or risk assessment. It's also valid in many other um, um, yeah, contexts, um, for example, um, cultural sciences, um, climate change impact, of course, food security also, that 
it's also related then to the agriculture science, but also public health. For example, I was uh, reading about uh, when ticks get active in spring, usually you need a number of days uh, above seven degree uh, average daily temperature. So with such a tool, you could generate the probability of these events. So it's also important for public health or uh, vector-borne diseases, for example, malaria. If you have very, uh, a, a sequence of very wet days and then it gets very warm. So this is something you could also simulate with a better generator. <coughs> so the underlying idea is that you extrapolate the weather and not, for example, the flood peaks. And this is a typical question, actually, that I'm asked is, yeah, but what's then the difference to, to numerical weather prediction? And um, both methods kind of have drawbacks or advantages, and it's summarized here in that table, actually. So weather generation is usually a statistical or stochastic tool based on weather data, whereas numerical weather prediction, depending on the model, is usually a physical description of the atmosphere and also how it's coupled with the land surface uh, land surface, oceans, vegetation, etc. Um, weather generation, you could say it's high spatial resolution. Because you start really from the gauge observation records and then you can interpolate. Whereas um, weather prediction has a lower um, resolution. That's the reason why we usually do downscaling or bias correction. Um, I would say that the precipitation amounts are more reliable because in the weather generation technique because we're really looking at the actual observation Whereas we know from numerical weather prediction that actually precipitation is the yeah most uh, problematic, let's say, variable. It's not a primary variable um, coming out from the numerical weather prediction model. Um, another very beautiful aspect is that weather generation is compared to numerical weather prediction not very costly, so you can easily on your PC run a lot of different scenarios. And um, then a drawback definitely of weather generation is that unlike um, numerical weather prediction, where you can really, where you have all these large scale dynamics, atmospheric dynamics, um, especially when we think then of interannual variability of rainfall, for example, that's kind of an issue in, in the uh, weather generation as you fit it to daily data and then you're sometimes missing these, let's say, yeah, um, yeah, the actual inter uh, um, annual variability, which is, for example, very important for. Um, Agriculture. So a lot of agricultural losses can really be linked to the interannual variability of the rainfall. Um, so, but um, of, very often they are combined. So that's what we're doing in the project here, that we use a weather generator then for downscaling of numerical weather prediction. So that's also possible. So now to summarize that, I would like to get everything into context. So this is the classic frequency analysis where you have the observed discharge data, then you apply the frequency analysis, and then you get the extremes. And if you look now at the other method, then you have start with the weather data, you calibrate a weather generator, and you like generate long time series, you extrapolate them. And at the same time, you take a hydrological model that you um, calibrate with the weather data and discharge data, and you feed those data into the hydrological model, and then you get your extreme events. And then it's much more physical, because you really have a hydrological model. And you get your low probability extreme events by uh, feeding the hydrological model with, I don't know, <coughs> long, very long time series to get the low frequency of the events. And then the beautiful aspect is that you can uh, consider climate change, and of course also if you're interested, for example, land use changes or um, hi um, hydraulic infrastructure. So all these aspects you can go for. And in my eyes, um, um, yeah, this is a much more hydrological, physical approach, depending of course on the models that you're using, even though the weather generator might be a stochastic tool primarily. So statistical and then a mixture of statistically and physical. Um, some further aspects, yeah, um, it's actually similar, to be very honest, to the flood frequency analysis. If you calibrate a weather generator, you also need a solid database. Uh, you cannot calibrate uh, to five years of uh, rainfall data and then extrapolate to, uh, I don't know, 50 times 100 years or something. Maybe that doesn't make much sense. 
And the reason that you need or you need a solid database, and that's the reason why most weather generation techniques are designed for daily time steps, because we usually have daily records that are very long, and only more recently, more and more high resolution uh, gauge stations are introduced. And then the workaround is that you, um, yeah, and we need high high resolution time series, especially for example in our approach, if you're talking about catchments of um, uh, 60 square kilometer. Uh, that means uh, daily resolution is not sufficient, so we need higher res uh, uh, resolution data. And then uh, the most reasonable approach and the most uh, applied approach is that you generate long time series of daily resolution for the weather, and then you disaggregate them using the short, let, let's say, um, less available information of high resolution data. So you need both, but that's, that's how it's usually done. Okay. Um, now I would like to talk about one approach for um, simulating daily rainfall at a single location. So this is actually a vector um, uh, taking, uh, taken for a month that you see here, so we have 31 days. And then we have um, binary information whether the day, the day is uh, um, rainy or dry and a certain uh, observed rainfall value. And the simplest model actually is um, a Markovian approach. So you have the uh, occurrence and the amount, so you do that separately. And if you start just with the occurrence, that it means zero and one. You can go for a very simple model, a two-state first-order Markov chain. And um, first order means, in that case, I mean, two states clear. First order means um, that the transition probabilities between the different states only depend on the previous member of the time series. You could also extend that um, and look at the net of the previous two, three, or four days. That's also possible. It's always the risk that at some point you might over-parameterize your model. And um, that means in the end you have four distinct transition probabilities. So from dry to dry, dry to wet, wet to dry, and wet to wet. Or if you make this in a figure, um, yeah, <coughs> for example, rainy day, there's a probability that it's rainy again, or then there's a probability that it's dry, and so on and so forth. That's the whole circle. And um, if you want to go for such a model, you only have to derive two parameters because they are, yeah, dependent on each other. So um, <coughs> P10 and P1, they, they, they sum up to one. So it's, it's very fairly easy to implement. And then you can uh, estimate the different, the two different um, parameters um, very simply. So um, that's one approach. And how do you simulate them? You just feed these this model with um, um, uniformly distributed random numbers, and then you can just go for long sequences. What you do then is actually when you simulate it uh, in your synthetic time series, a uh, rainy day, then uh, you can just stand up from a probability distribution. So for example, the gamma distribution is uh, um, used a lot, um, but even though it's often gamma distributed, it's not always the case, because what we know is that sometimes there's an issue with the tail, so gamma distribution tends to underestimate extreme events. So what is done usually is that you have a hybrid curve. So you have a gamma, for example, for lower rainfall amounts, and then a Pareto curve, for example, for higher rainfall amounts. And um, it's the same principle. If you have a rainy day, you just randomly sample from that curve. And by that, you can easily generate very long um, um, synthetic rainfall time series at a single location. Some remarks, this is just to make it tangible, this one example uh, from a catchment in um, France, the Ubai catchment, that's in the southern French Alps. So I have 34 observation years. This is, for example, 100 synthetic years. Just what I want to make clear here is that for example, um, you have a couple of unobserved extreme events. So this is what we are interested in the end when we do um, uh, more physically based flood frequency analysis. And, but you can also simulate other, um, of course, um, variables with a weather, weather generator. Temperature, we'll talk about in a minute. Wind, solar radiation, that's also very important because um, in our project when we use um, uh, new age, we need radiation. 
and um, then you can use Markov parameters um, to get the seasonal cycle because of course these transition probabilities changed in reality over the seasons so you can estimate them monthly seasonally or you can also fit the Fourier, Fourier model for example to the uh, annual cycle of these transition probabilities also a nice way of getting seasonality into your model um, temperature is actually also not that uh, complicated so what we know is that actually daily temperature and variability have general trends um, this is actually the mean temperature for each day over the year you can see there's a clear trend those are like fitted for E series this is the daily variability over the year usually the daily variability of temperature is higher in winter and um, this is where you start from actually so you have these two components, the deterministic components, and when you remove these components from your time series, what is actually remaining is noise. Um, and um, that noise actually is assumed to be Gaussian, normally distributed. Sometimes it's maybe not, then you can make it uh, Gaussian. For example, there's an example here um, that was a station, I think, in um, in the Salzach catchment in Austria, you see it's not really Gaussian, but then you can power transform it to make it Gaussian and then uh, fit the model. And um, in that case, it was a um, so called modulus transformation, which is nice because you can also apply it to negative values. So then you can kind of influence it differently to the negative and positive values. Um, so, very simplistic, it's just the two deterministic components plus noise. And um, the noise, actually, there are different models to simulate um, autocorrelated noise. So they're all actually belonging to this class of Fox Jenkins models um, that you find in every statistical uh, package, actually. I used the uh, autoregressive moving average model um, that has um, autoregressive parameters and moving average parameters. And the idea is actually that the temperature on the following day defined by a linear relationship of a number of current days and some added random noise. That's the basic idea, actually. Um, but there might be different models, Arima, and I mean, this is, again, a known research field. Um, but I think, usually, um, I tend to go for more simplistic approaches that you also maybe understand them in the end. Um, but yeah, for you, it's mainly important uh, to know right now that you have these two deterministic components and then you just add some, some random noise. Um, to finish this off, the single side simulation, um, what's important actually is that, of course, there's a relationship between temperature and rainfall. So if that's the figure again that I showed to you before with the daily mean, um, that would be the curves here for uh, this, like the annual curve for all the precipitation days in blue or all the dry days. And what you see is actually that in winter, if it's dry, it's usually colder, and in summer, it's the other way around. And um, if it's rainy, usually in winter, it's warmer, and in summer, it's cooler. And what you do is actually, and that's what most weather generation techniques are doing, that you first simulate the rainfall, and then you simulate temperature and condition it on the simulated rainfall. So in that case, um, what you usually do is that you derive two cycles for the temperature from your observations, one for all the precipitation days and one for all the dry days, and then you just um, condition it to it. So very simplistic. Are there any questions right now? Okay, then I move on to spatial modeling. Um, spatial modeling, actually, the biggest issue is rainfall. So rainfall is really a very complex, chaotic phenomenon, and um, this intermittent nature of rainfall in time and space um, yeah, <coughs> makes things very complex. Um, but you need it, of course, um, for any kind of spatial application. So if you think of our Haberloschka model, um, it's very important. And, um, but as it's actually a very complex topic, um, different authors have, have has come up with a lot of different approaches. Um, like fully parametric, non-parametric, and semi-parametric models usually, that's one classification. 
that's a very nice publication by, by Gordia in the Journal of Climate, and he has done, now it's also a bit outdated from 2010, like an inventory, a review of uh, models that have been um, um, proposed, and you see they are very different from each other. Like the hybrid model, Neyman Scott, rectangular pulses, non-parametric model, um, parametric model, um, hybrid rec regression model, so it's really, people have come up with a lot of very interesting um, original ideas. Um, and this is also a bit of a problem because at the end of the day you don't know anymore which model you should use for which purpose. Because all research units use their, their own model and you, there's actually hardly any study that really compares this model in a very structured way. Also the problem sometimes that um, um, not everybody's willing to share the code, maybe the executable, but not necessary to code, and then it's, it's really difficult to compare these models. Um, this is just one example that uh, for a model that I developed. Um, there's also a recent paper now that you can have a look at, um, and I will briefly explain how that model works. It's also very simplistic. So um, in that case, it's a spatial model for four different um, sites, so you have different days, and the four different sites with some rainfall observation, which I call amount vectors. So that's one, one day is one vector, is a number of amounts or um, dry days. And what, you, what the model first does is actually in very simplistic, it uh, translates it into so-called occurrence vectors, which simply a, a, a rainy day is a one, and a dry day uh, stays a zero. And what you do then is actually that you cluster these daily snapshots, these daily um, um, occurrence vectors, you cluster them in according to their similarity. So in that case, I use a, I use a Hamming distance uh, k-means clustering because that can handle a binary information. And then you might get different clusters. For example, these three here uh, are very similar. You have one um, uh, dry day here, but they're quite similar. Same applies to this one. So that's the first thing that you do. So you could say that actually, or you could argue that the clustering kind of um, inherently considers maybe certain, let's say, weather situations. Um, that's the first step. And what you can do then is actually, once you have done the clustering, you can also use a Markovian process to um, generate synthetic sequences of these, these clusters. So you might go for a Markov chain <coughs> that comes up with a completely new combination of these um, clusters or daily snapshots. In that case, we have uh, one, four, yeah, uh, four, four different ones, so it would be a four-state um, Markov chain. And that's the first thing you do. And once you have uh, created your synthetic time series, then what you do is actually you look up the cluster ID and then you just it's like a bootstrap sample from your observations, one snapshot that belongs to that cluster. And by that way, you can um, build up new, like synthetic time series by just um, um, resampling from your observations. Um, that's one approach, for example, there's also nearest neighbor resampling, for example, it's used a lot. Um, so that's one thing. The problem is now you have built your artificial time series but you still have only the observed rainfall amounts. And um, what the model does basically is that, let's say this is um, a, a sequence from January, let's say, then you fit again a parametric distribution function like a gamma to your January rainfall, and you randomly sample for each day a certain rainfall amount. The problem is what you now see here. So those are fake amounts, you can see it here. For example, we have 13.2 uh, millimeters of rainfall and the observations, the maximum was 10.3. So okay, we have some streams also, some artificial rainfall, but we destroy the whole correlation structure now. Again, very simplistic. Um, so if you look at the first side, so we have certain ranks and in our um, sampled um, vector, we have completely different ranks, which is why the correlation structure is destroyed. And what the model does is, okay. 
yeah, just resamples them. The same applies, for example, the second one, again, different ranks, and then we just shift the amount so that the ranks are kind of filled. That's the basic idea of the model, actually. So you've, that's the whole overview of everything. Um, maybe not so important for now. Um, you can have a look at the, um, at the paper, and also in the paper is a link where you also can download the model from GitHub. Um, another approach, I just want to briefly address this because this is one of the most cited spatial rainfall generators it's by Daniel Wilkes. And what he does basically, in the beginning I was talking about this Markovian model at a single location. What he proposes actually that you have, in my case, we talked about four different sites, so he would fit four different of these Markovian models for each site separately, and then drive them with correlated random numbers. But it turns out, actually, if you do that, that you underestimate the inter-site correlations. So his approach is actually to drive the model with correlated numbers that are highly or more, more correlated, actually, than any observation. What he found out is actually that there is a monotonic relationship between the observed and simulated correlation. In that case, this is an example for one site. So here, you have the observed correlation, and you have the simulated ones. So that means if you, it's like a empirical way of doing it. So what he did is he just constantly increased the correlations of the random numbers to see at which point they match the observations. And in that case, for example, you would need correlated random numbers, random numbers that are um, that have a value of uh, a correlation of uh, almost one actually to achieve the observed correlation of 0 0.8. So. That's the problem with the model, so it's quite costly to calibrate the model, but that's the trick. And if you compare now, for example, again, this, these are two models probably in a landscape of dozens of models, and especially in the last 10 years, a lot of um, authors have published new rainfall generators. So Triple M, for example, that's the model I was presenting. So um, one problem is that um, you might duplicate some of the sequences I'm not going too much into detail now why, but this is a general issue in bootstrap models. And, but and we found out, okay, if we, if we only have a duplication of 1% in our, in our simulations, then still the model does a very good job. Um, still, we don't recommend it for very large spatial scales because then the Markovian process, we have too many states, so we over-parameterize the model. So usually, uh, what we found out is actually if you stay below like um, 200 kilometer maximum site distance, it does a very good job. It's not necessarily suitable for very large scales. But it's very good in terms, um, in two aspects. First of all, it's very good in terms of the inter-annual variability of rainfall. And the other thing is the persistence of weather events. So the persistence of weather events, for example, a frontal system that stays for a while. And you can kind of proxy for the persistence of weather events, for example, the lacked correlation. So you look at the lag correlation between diff the different sites. And the model does a fairly good job with that, so that might be important. Whereas the Wilkes model, um, you can actually apply to any scale, because you always have these independent models uh, at each site, and not like these daily snapshots looking at the whole like um, uh, region. That means that you will never um, impact the site-specific performance, but it turned out that the model is not very good in simulating the persistence of the weather events. Now it's the problem that refers back to when I was showing you all the, the, the review of all these different models, that what does it mean in the end if you do a simulation, for example, flood hazard assessment and catchment, what, what aspects are then at the end really important? So there is hardly any study out there that has ever looked at these things in a strategic way. Um, it depends probably. Spatial temper uh, temperature modeling is quite easy. Um, the reason is that temperature is a continuous field and not like intermittent like the rainfall. And what I found out, um, that's from a publication in the journal Meteorological Applications. For example, um, I was talking about these um, 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 autoregressive models with these two deterministic components. Those you can simply run um, with correlated random numbers. And that's 
that are observed and simulated intersite correlations, and you can see it's quite a good fit. So that works fairly well with temperature. It's, it's not a big deal. The rainfall is usually the bigger issue. This application, that's only one slide because this is also a very big research field actually. So as I said, um, we usually start from daily because we have a solid database, then we simulate and then we disaggregate. There are a lot of different uh, methods. For example, the microcanonical model, which was, I think, first introduced by Olson, a Swedish researcher in the 1990s, I think. And the idea is quite simple that you have your daily simulation or observation, and then you like disaggregate step by step according to empirical like um, yeah distribution frequencies for each different levels. Um, that works fairly well, I have to say. But I also realized again that there's a risk that you overparameterize your model. So especially when you think of the different seasons, usually the same relationships are applied over the entire year. Otherwise, you don't have enough observation data to really um, um, fit that model. Poisson cluster model, more complex. I'm actually in favor of something very simplistic, which is the so-called method of fragments. It simply takes the like relative distribution of the rainfall of a day um, from the observations, and then you take your synthetic daily rainfall amount, and you just distribute it in the same way. That means that um, in an algorithm, if you have simulated a day, you just look for a day that is kind of in the same season or around the window of, let's say, a couple of days. Then you look up a similar rainfall um, a total amount, then you disaggregate it exactly in the same way. And what you also do usually is that you um, also s like um, look at the position of the day. For example, is it an isolated rainy day between two dry days? That is an indicator that's a convective event, for example. Or is it like uh, followed and preceded by, by a rainy day, then it's more frontal. So just to make sure that you don't disaggregate, for example, a, uh, a daily amount which is more likely to be convective, because maybe it's very extreme, with like a frontal distribution which might be off more evenly over the day. So there are different aspects you also have to follow, but it's at least something that is quite easy to implement. But again, that's what I'm working on right now. As soon as you go spatial, it's not so easy anymore. But just to make you aware, that's the basic principle, daily and then you disaggregate. So now steep streams, that's the project. Um, the idea in steep streams basically is we have different catchments here around the area. So we have Meledrio, Sporeccio, and Castalunga. Yeah. So quite small catchments around yeah, 50 square kilometers in area roughly and um, the idea is to yeah, actually come up for new so so solutions for um, hydraulic structures so the main focus is actually flash floods and uh, hyper concentrated flows and uh, now the working group of um, Ricardo and Giuliano are now quite closely collab collaborating so I'm here now to work on the hydrologic model and then, then we exchange knowledge in terms of the weather generation and then we discuss how to approach these things. So that, that's the basic idea of the project. And um, that's actually the whole framework now from a steep streams perspective. So we have the observed weather data that goes into a weather generator and calibrate it. Then we have the observed weather data that are highly resolution and also the discharge data, for example hourly. We use that to, dis uh, to calibrate our disaggregation method and the hydrological model. And then actually we can do simulations. So one for the observed period. So we can go for a lot of runs to get our predicted hydrograph for the observation. Or the same if we calibrate the weather generator for climate change. We can do the same for our projections for the climate impact. That's the basic idea of the framework. So this but then would probably the new H model, this might be the triple M model or the Wilkes model, method of fragments, all these different aspects. And um, that's basically the framework that I was showing in the beginning, but a bit more specific now. Um, models for steep streams, so I was thinking um, of using different 
types of uh, rainfall generators and the autoregressive model for the temperature. This aggregation method, yeah, kind of a spatial method of fragments. Um, for the hydrological model, we have discussed that we are using, of course, the new H model, but we might also use the HPD. So a second one. And then climate projection, this is something we have to discuss how we approach it, because there are many different ways of, of, of going, um, looking at uh, into climate. And the idea is that it is one of the research ideas of our two research groups now, that we do a big uncertainty analysis in terms of or with, with, with focus on the flood hazard assessment, so that we really look at what's the contribution of these different components to the overall uncertainty, what, what does really matter. So is it maybe, for example, because I'm focusing on it more, uh, does the daily weather generated, is, is, is it really so important, or is it maybe the calibration of the disaggregation method? Or for the hydrological models, is, is lower complexity an issue maybe than for the resultant hydrograph? All these different aspects can, we can address by doing a uncertainty analysis, because this is actually the main research field of uh, my supervisor, Giuliano. He does a lot of uncertainty research. So a couple of open questions. This is actually what I was discussing with Ricardo. Um, now I talked about weather generation for temperature and rainfall, but we might also need radiation or humidity. And then the question is, how can we approach that? So is that like also a wind, maybe? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> because the point is, you of course cannot calibrate your uh, hydrological model to let's say five meteorological variables and then feed it only with two. It must be consistent. And then the choice of the study areas, maybe it's not so important for, for now, but we found out that Sporetsu is influenced by a large reservoir. Can we model it? I don't know. Yes. Yeah, okay. And then you climate mean, uh, change. Sorry, yeah. do you mean in terms of evaporation? Or? No, there is a, there apparently the, 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 there's a problem with the gauge records, because there is a reservoir apparently, so then it's probably difficult to, to calibrate the model. Sporeggio doesn't have any reservoir. It doesn't? No. Sporeggio. And the thermometer is uh, above the, um, for Sporeggio is above the, the lake uh, Santa Giustina. Okay. If we can uh, have uh, some uh, information uh, in, the, in uh, another hydrometer, I don't know. But, uh, ah, okay, so the hydrometer is not on the Sporeggio, Sporeggio okay. yes. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, climate change, I mean, there, there are methods, for example, to condition weather models to circulation patterns, and then to changes of the distribution of these circulation patterns. So my question would be, is there something, some weather classification for the Trentino region available, for example, and maybe even projections? Maybe our colleagues here. Yeah. So a yeah. couple of questions, I think we're in a good way, yes. but um, of course some, some uh, things we have still have to clarify. That's it, basically. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>
and your um, your um, climate model output for the reference period. So you fit a model to that, then you make your observation observations, and then you take the um, the, the future simulation of the climate model as a predictor. And by that you can have to, then you have changes for for the number of rainy days, for example, and drying bed spells and these things. So this is also one approach: logistic regression. Um, but yeah, this is something I'm. I and are there already study which no. make comparison with the dynam dynamic of dynamic no scaling? Um, because basically, mm -hmm. this issue you don't have this issue with dynamic no scaling. Yeah. it's more costly from a computational point of view. Then you have the problem <coughs> that how do you then then you cannot generate a large number of scenarios. Yeah. Then you have the problem how do you address it in yeah. the uncertainty analysis, especially for like the uncertainty of a, of the hydrograph or um, mm -hmm. a flat peak. Yeah. So that's the reason why we are more looking into um, more simplistic um, and statistical downscaling approaches. Okay. Otherwise, it's really a problem for uncertainty analysis. Because okay. yeah. of course, it can overcome some of the issues with, with okay. dynamical downscaling. Okay, a last comment just to spare you some time. Uh, daily totals amount are, are uh, distributed according to a gamma in, uh, in the Trentino region. I did some calculation. Are yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, there is just a threshold, a low threshold of a few millimeters, but after basically 95% of the station are distributed according to the gamma. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the temperature, uh, a Gaussian model is also okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have some paper, something written on that? No, we, we tried to put that in a paper regarding uncertainty with the Stefano, but basically it was not so good results, so I did the calculation. But we, did, we didn't publish. It was not yeah. not worth for publishing. But it's good because that makes the downscaling probably much it, easier. It's a, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, we didn't check the the, the, with, the with the Marconian Markovian J Marconian method because basically we had uh, interpolation with Kriging providing uh, uh, already uh, a conditional mean. So we already knew if the state was dry or wet, mm -hmm. and we just wanted to to generate different fields starting from that. Mm -hmm. So we just used the part of uh, generating the amount mm -hmm. and not checking the Markovian chain. Mm -hmm. So I cannot say if uh, at one state the Markovian chain is the correct one, but the totals are gamma distributed. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's good to know. But, um, can the, the work by Stefano be connected with this kind of sti things more or less? Uh, I, I don't know, just mm -hmm. I just the, the check of, uh, I think just the, checking which kind of distribution could be used for each dif different stations, basically. Because then we try to make, uh, to evaluate the uncertainty and the estimation of the precipitation field, and we generate some, some fields. But basically, it comes out that uh, the, 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 um, the total amounts were not so high, not so different, basically. So at the end, it was not so worth to include in a trend analysis. Mm -hmm. I, I originally, we thought that uh, the uncertainty reproduction of the rainfall field could be so high that it could affect the trend analysis, mm -hmm. but it turns out that it was not the case. Mm -hmm. So we, did, we didn't uh, expand on this. Yeah, if, if, I, if I may comment, uh, there are uh, two, I mean, two activities. One is, uh, one was related to the interpolation of existing uh, uh, precipitation, like in a mm -hmm. period uh, going from the 50s to, 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 to now, basically. That's one. Uh, this one is the the, the work that Bruno mentioned. Mm -hmm. But we have also simulations at the at the catchment scale, but at on the large basin, on the Adige basin. So mm -hmm. these these are very small catchments, and mm -hmm. I don't know. We, we may extract we may, uh, yeah. information there and see mm -hmm. uh, what is going on. But I'm not expecting uh, a better. Uh, the reproduction than with a specific model dealing with uh, with a particular catchment because of course in the when you look at the large mm -hmm. catchment is more difficult to capture what happens at a small sub basin uh, i but, but let's say this w what we did is is available of course um uh, i i ever ever Question based on uh, have a question on the the uh, spatial distribution of the of the rainfall. You mentioned that uh, when you disaggregate uh, mm -hmm. 
from from the daily precipitation time in a single uh, rain gauge. Yeah. Rain gauge. You you if I understood correctly, what what, what you do is to identify typical. Uh, uh, distributions mm -hmm. within the day, they say only distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, you identify different type of uh, distribution <coughs> according to maybe to the season, to the type of event, yeah. uh, whatever, and then you, are, you, you assign this type of variability uh, to the, to, in, in, to the um, early uh, data that you produce by using by using the your weather generator based on the on, on the daily scale. Yeah, I hope I understand it correctly. So can maybe I repeat um, again what, what I tried to say. Sorry if that was not clear. So what what you do is actually you you have a let's say you simulate a certain rainfall amount. Of yeah, in a day. Millimeter for a day, and then that comes from your weather generator. Right. And then you look at your observations. Yeah. Let's say it is on the 1st of January and then you go back 10 days and forth 10 days and you have the window or like say you have 20, 20 days then because you don't take the actual the same day mm -hmm. and you take all the observations that fit these dates and then you look up in, in this inventory of ob observations that fits this, this particular seasonal like snapshot you look up a similar rainfall amount and then you distribute the synthetic daily amount exactly in the same way then is, has been distributed for the um, uh, in, in, in your observations. So you just impose this, or you assume it's the same, like. Um, but uh, which, but, but, but probably you, 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 so you need hourly data for that. Yeah, course. but probably you end up with many different uh, distributions in different years. Uh, and what, what, what do you mean with that? Oh no, you, you are looking at the same at the same period. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, yeah. I was thinking yeah. to, to project yeah, in the you future. Like a, a mid window that moves through your through the whole year. And then it's the first of January, you take like days around the first of January from all your observations. Yeah. Then from this inventory you look for a similar day, then you disaggregate it exactly in the same way in the as same way. the observations. Okay, so, so you, you, you shut the that, that by that you make sure that you don't come up with a weird distribution of rainfall. That for example, a summer, like a convective mm -hmm. distribution. But how, do, how do you define a similar day? A similar day just by, what is done usually is that is a, like a nearest neighbor algorithm. Uh -huh. So you give, uh, it's a stochastic process. So let's say you choose, you take the seven most similar days. Mm -hmm. and then according to the rainfall amount, you give each day a certain probability. So the more likely the, or the, 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 the more similar, the the total amount is the more likely is that you that you sample from that day, mm -hmm. but then of course you also have the parameter as a rested model. So as soon as you go for more days that you include, then you will spread. Of course, yeah. you all. Yeah. But uh, over yeah. the question was not this. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the question was, uh, uh, how do you transfer this uh, to the spatial distribution? Yeah, that's, that's the point. I have to think about that. Okay. Probably um, I need to go for yeah, like a, a spatial distance. Yeah like that you compare vectors in terms of the distance, something like that. But that's what I'm working on right now. It has been done as a research group in, um, I think it's in Innsbruck, or it's mm -hmm. Alpes, this research institute. And I think they, they have done something like that. But, but yeah. when you do this, are you, are you looking to extreme events or are you looking to the normal events? Each because case disaggregated. So you yeah, because continuous modeling. You know, probably in the, in the extreme events, which are very, uh, which are important for, for flooding, maybe they are more similar than... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there, there is less variability, I, mm -hmm. I assume, in the, mm -hmm. in, the, in the extreme events, because they, are, they should be more similar. I'm wondering, just wondering, mm -hmm. so that, that, may, may, that may help in some way. Another comment which follows up the question by Alberto, well, I, I, we saw in, we collaborated in the past, uh, even though we didn't use the weather generator, with a group of uh, Ale Foller in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. And I know that they're using a weather generator with convective, convective cells of mm -hmm. uh, a lissoid form, mm -hmm. which yeah, moves and mm -hmm. disappear, losing correlation. They're already in, in intrinsically spatially distributed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That could be an option. Did you already compare this kind of different models with yours? I know that mm -hmm. would be more time consuming for a Well, then I would, would have to ask her if she has the model. Ah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, that, that's, that's the point. 
and that, that's a general issue because usually these things are too complex just to write up the code now and you know so yeah. I mean that could be an option to ask her but then yeah maybe it's it's quite uh, Adam Barton was I yeah. think it was in the list uh, yeah. that he mentioned yeah. he, he was the developer mm -hmm. of the code mm -hmm. okay yeah that, of course I mean that we could think about it yeah yeah, yeah. okay Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, very good. Okay. Maybe we have the same question. No. <laughs> a comment. Uh, Lorenz Giovannini, Atmospheric Physics Group. Mm -hmm. uh, we performed the uh, weather classification, uh, classification of weather types for the Trentino region for nice the case. last mm -hmm. uh, 20 years. Mm -hmm. And there are two papers on this uh, mm -hmm. topic. Maybe we can talk uh, if you are interested. It can be useful for your work. Yeah, that would be uh, very nice. And have you also done kind of, have you looked into the future also? Like no, already at the past. Okay. The past. And w are there any trends in the data for certain no. patterns? No. For, uh, we looked at the correlation between uh, weather types and uh, local variables, so mm -hmm. temperature, uh, precipitation, and also extreme uh, events. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, we didn't find any particular trend. That's good to know. Thanks. Uh, yes. Just a question for the sports case. Mm -hmm. um, the time series you get from the moon, which time scale can you have a property? Can you, uh, sorry, I didn't understand the first so part. So you of the get question. the time series from your model? Yeah. Yes. What's the resolution in time? Ah, uh, that's hourly. Okay. Hourly resolution, yeah. Right now I'm working hourly. So of course we could also uh, go even higher. I mean, depends on the observation data, but I guess most of the information is hourly or 30 mm -hmm. minutes. The format of 30 minutes are 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. 30 well, minutes, yeah. yeah. Sometimes 15 minutes, but I don't 15, know. Yeah. But I don't know in that in that part of the region. But that increases, of course, then the computational costs and in the simulation, right? Yeah. yeah. There's one of the issues which mm -hmm. might be very well captured by synthetic but the generator compared to the dynamic ones mm -hmm. might be the small scale features of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would be otherwise uh, nowadays numerical weather prediction models can easily say cover even small scale events. Mm -hmm. So we get comparable costs because the computational costs are going down and down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that. So if there are no other questions, we can thanks you again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming.